everyone. This is the video that goes with uh, chapter 10, the chapter on neo-Freudians and sort of psychoanalytic theory um, beyond Freud. Um, so um, just to recap um, chapter nine, um, your book has a really um, positive view, or the, the author of the book has a really positive view of Freud and the continuing contributions that Freud has made to the field. So I think it's really important. You don't always get that perspective when you hear people talking about Freud, um, because there's a lot of um, a lot of people bring up the psychosexual stages, which, as I've mentioned before, and as you'll see in the book, um, really aren't a thing. And so uh, if you focus on that, then you're not going to think that uh, Freud is, uh, his theory is still relevant. Um, but there are parts of it that are very relevant uh, even today. So um, when you're thinking about, and just to recap last week, and when you're thinking about the uh, pleasure principle um, that Freud talked about, um, think about an infant crying. You know, that is all about, um, you know, things are not perfect and I want things to be perfect. So um, just sort of keep in mind how we think about those things um, as you're moving forward through the rest of this material and also through the rest of the course and how you reflect on personality after the course. Um, so Freud wasn't wrong. He wasn't even wrong because his theory is not scientific. So um, you can't disprove it because of the way that he posed his um, his thoughts. So um, so there's that. Um, so the Neo-Freudians. Um, the Neo-Freudians were much less interested in sex. They were much less interested in unconscious, um, sort of your unconscious existence um, and, you know, all of that as a source of what's driving your behavior in life. Um, and they were much more um, interested in uh, relationships, interpersonal relationships, um, and your, your sort of conscious thought processes and how those work. Um, so you'll see a number of new theorists in this chapter. Um, Alfred Adler talking about the inferiority complex, um, Carl Jung, um, the idea of the collective unconscious, um, Erickson. And when you think about Erickson, Erickson talked about psychosocial crises. And I may have mentioned this before, but I think it's, it bears repeating. Um, a crisis in psychology is a period of active exploration. So, you know, just keep in mind that, you know, when, when you and I talk about somebody having a crisis, it's something bad. It's always something negative. And it wasn't that way for Erickson. In psychology, when you talk about a crisis in this context, and what they're talking about is a period of change, active exploration, um, possibly moving you to the next level. Um, so very different than the kind of crisis you would have on the side of the road with a flat tire. Um, and then object relations theory. Um, and object relations theory, I find very difficult, or I found it very difficult when I was first working with it. It's not my area of research, so I'm sure I would still find it difficult if I was doing the research. Um, but it's that idea that um, we have an you know, we perceive other people as an object, um, and that may or may not match reality. So what we think of them is what we think of them. That is the object for us, and that's what we're reacting to. Now, are they, re excuse me, are they really like that? We don't know. Um, you know, you could know somebody very well and not be able to predict 100% of what they would say or what they would do next. Um, one of the things to, um, that, that I like to bring up in class um, during this chapter um, is uh, there are a couple of quotes in the book, and one of them is um, the unconscious is terribly threatening, and it suggests that we're moved by forces we can't see or control, and this is a severe wound to our narcissism. Um, and I think what that means is um, we're uncomfortable with thinking about the unconscious. We would like to think that we control all of our own behaviors, um, and using psychoanalytic theory, we don't. Um, that there are definitely some things going on that are beyond conscious awareness, at least from a Freudian perspective, and sometimes from a neo-Freudian perspective. And the other one is, um, um, this is another quote that's in this chapter, um, any theory that's entirely comfortable to discuss is probably missing something important about what it means to be human. Um, and so when you meet people and it's like, you know, what, what bothers you? What keeps you awake at night? Um, I used to ask students in some of my social psych classes to do a project on something that mattered to them. And one semester we did sustainability and we've done you know, different kinds of projects. Um, I don't teach that class anymore, so I haven't done it for a while. Um, and, you know, when you ask somebody what keeps you awake at night, we're not saying what literally kept you awake last night, but what are the kinds of things that you worry about in an enduring way? And if somebody says nothing, the world's fine with me, I don't, I don't really worry about anything, then they're probably missing something, right? They're not thinking about things because there are a lot of things to worry about in the world. It doesn't mean we have to worry about them every day all the time. Um, but if you can't think of anything that worries you, then you're definitely probably missing some really important parts of what it means to be human. Um, when you get to the section on attachment, um, there's a um, controversy is probably overstating it, but there are different views of attachment um, in, in psychology. Um, and one view is if you think back to the biological chapter, we talked about temperament and we talked about how there are some biological bases of behavior. It's not determined biologically, um, but it's definitely has a strong influence. So 
Um, so an infant is born with a temperament, um, and that temperament uh, develops into uh, what will become their adult personality. And when we're testing attachment and whether a child or a person is securely attached to others um, in an experimental way, usually what we're doing is stressing the child to the max and then seeing whether they will be comforted by the renewed presence of their attachment figure or of their, of their caregiver in this case. Um, and, and, and by doing that, um, the, uh, psychologists, researchers have put children and people into different categories of attachment, being securely attached, being insecurely attached in a number of different ways, either by avoiding people or having ambivalent feelings about people. Um, and that's one way of thinking about it. But another way of thinking about it that I'd like you to at least reflect on is um, think about the biological behaves, uh, basis of behavior and a child with a difficult temperament or somebody who has high levels of trait level anxiety when put in that kind of a situation is going to behave in a different way. Um, and that way may, um, may lead researchers to think that they are insecurely attached when in reality, you're just looking at the behavioral manifestation of having a high level of trait anxiety. Um, so is attachment a separate thing or is attachment something that people do because of the personality or some of the personality variables that they already have? Um, there isn't a strong correlation between infant attachment and adult attachment. Um, it's not nothing, but, um, but uh, being insecurely attached as a child does not mean that we know exactly how that person will um, develop uh, interpersonal relationships as an adult. Um, okay, um, so that's it for what I wanted to say about this chapter. Um, in the next set of chapters, we're going to be talking about positive psychology and humanism and existentialism. Um, read ahead if you want to. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have some interesting things to do when we get there. Um, and I hope that uh, as you work through the material in Chapter 10, um, that, you know, that you think about what, how the assignments are relating to what you're reading. And it gives you a little bit more of a flavor for uh, what that kind of research is like. So have a great week um, and uh, let me know if you've got any questions. Thanks. Bye.